Hello everybody, Minty Della Cruz here, host of Lincoln Live. Today I'm so excited to be live right here at the Roseville campus of John Adams Academy. And joining me today are Norman Gonzalez, the Director of Outreach and Compliance for John Adams Academy, and Heather Brown, the Headmaster of Elementary. So first of all, I wanna thank you both for joining me. Thanks for being here, we're excited to talk with you today. Yeah, thanks for being with us, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Can you guys start off by telling me a little bit about yourself and I'll start with you, Heather? Sure, so I have been with um, John Adams Academy since um, 2011 when we opened our doors and so we're going into our 10th year. Um, we have three campuses and I've had the opportunity to be a teacher, I've had an opportunity to work as Dean of Elementary and now I'm in a position to oversee our elementary program across all three campuses and we're very excited um, to share with you a little bit more about our Lincoln program that is um, expanding this year. Awesome. And Norman? Yes, yeah, so Norman Gonzalez, and currently I'm the Director of Outreach and Compliance. I started as a founding board member of John Adams Academy, so I came on the team. Uh, she shorted herself a little bit. She joined us in 2009 uh, <laughs> when we were putting the school together Correct. before there was a school, and I joined the team at the same time and uh, was a founding board member. We started the school here in Roosevelt in 2011, and I transitioned off the board into a role in operations. Uh, and Heather came on as headmaster, came up from, from teacher, and, uh, and then I transitioned over to, uh, to now as we have multiple sites, operations uh, for the outreach and for the compliance. And so we're looking to, uh, to start new schools and to support new communities that are looking for jobs academies and really make sure that as many families and communities that want our program are able to experience it. So would you guys mind just giving the viewers uh, an overview of what makes John Adams Academy different um, and unique in, in the educational approach? So we are a free public charter school, um, which means that you can attend our academy um, by parent choice, um, by family choice at any time you're able to apply for our academy and if we have space, you're able to join us. Um, we are a classical, an American classical educational model and what that means is that we are um, based and rooted in um, liberty we're rooted our curriculum is rooted in classical classical literature um, classics throughout whether it be art music drama our history we're rich in American history um, we are governed by um, ten core values which are a key component to who we are and embedded in those um, are a love of academic excellence um, our American heritage and the amazing country that we live in and a love and a pride um, in that. Um, we value virtue in our scholars. We encourage them to do their best, to be entrepreneurs, to be creative. Um, and all of that is with the goal of developing our scholars into servant leaders. And so our academic program is not just about reading and writing and arithmetic, but it is rooted in servant leadership and our core values. A lot of people don't realize that for a public charter school, um, not only are we not uh, having tuition, a lot of people think that we're a private school. They look at, oh, that's an amazing program, I can't afford it. We're a tuition-free public charter school. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that there are no geographic boundaries. They're used to their traditional neighborhood public school where you have to live within a certain zip code or you have to live within a certain area and you have an attendance boundary and that's the particular school you have to go to. Charters, there's no geographic boundary. So anyone can apply to a charter school anywhere in the state of California. And so our schools actually draw regionally from throughout the multiple counties around this area. So we have folks that drive in from um, probably the six county region around here to come to our schools. Wow. And what would you attribute your growth to? Um, I, a lot of folks that are applying, they're looking for that classical uh, education um, uh, mo model. They're also looking for a safe environment that's based on principles and um, and it's steeped not only in classics, which are looking at these primary source documents, but also mentors. Mm -hmm. So um, our philosophy is that you're not dropping your child off for an education here and then we take them and we fix them and we, we manipulate them and then we can give them back. Parents are the primary educators of their children, right? And so Johns County partners with the parent, partners with the scholar, who's taking control and ownership of their own education. And then our teachers are mentors that come alongside and facilitate that learning and support that learning. And are really inspiring them to, to learn and grow. Because it's ultimately the child who's going to control their own education. Absolutely, I completely agree. 
You know, one of the things that was most impressive um, from, from my experience with one of your scholars, I uh, had participated in the Leadership Lincoln program. Mm -hmm. And so there was a whole day centered around education. And so just really seeing how your scholars showed up, uh, the, the young man in particular that stands out in my mind, uh, he was, you know, he spoke, he was poised, he, he was very articulate, uh, very respectful. And so that really looked to me like, you know, somebody that had been, uh, you know, really at the college level. And, and, and this guy was a, a senior in high school. So it was so impressive just to see, you know, the way that your education and model has molded him into a, a successful young man. Um, very, very impressive. Um, so I know that there's a lot of people watching that have a lot of different education needs for their children. I understand you guys also um, facilitate IEPs, correct? Absolutely. Um, so we have a robust special education program. And so when scholars come to us with a need, a variety of need, whether it be um, speech and language pathology or whether it be they need um, significant supports to be able to engage in our academic program, we provide those. And so we firmly believe that um, our special education department needs to be personal mm -hmm. and it needs to be um, really responsive and, and work specifically with each child's needs. It's not a one size fits all. And so we really build a strong relationship with our parents and families who bring their children to us with their needs. We have a wonderful special education department that works to serve all of those needs. And, and there are times where a child has a unique or special need that might be beyond what our current staffing is. And if that's ever the case, then we contract out or we seek to find other providers to help support us in educating that scholar so that we're meeting those needs regardless of what they are. Because we fully believe that every scholar, regardless of need, regardless of um, background, regardless of personal experience, should have access to this education that we're providing and we will do everything we can to make sure that happens. I just love that. That is so awesome, especially as a parent of children that have IEPs, mm -hmm. you know, that the, the standpoint that you guys take is just awesome. I love it. So um, I know there's something, uh, a hot topic, right, that's on the minds of all parents right now as we um, are within a week of starting school. And that is, you know, what is this school year going to look like for our kids? And I know that you guys can't really answer that on the you know, long term, right. but, but um, with that beautiful new campus in Lincoln um, and, you know, just kind of, in the midst of everything that we're, we're dealing with at this point. Can you speak to us about that, Heather? Absolutely. So we are thrilled and excited about opening this beautiful new campus. And, and to be really frank and honest with you, it's heartbreaking for us that day one, we can't open the door and fill it with scholars, right? That is our heart and that is our deepest Can we take desire. a quick minute to talk about the campus? Absolutely, that's yes. a perfect segue. If you Absolutely. want to just talk a little bit about what this new building is, right. so uh, share that excitement. We have built a 92,000 square foot facility um, and it has um, athletic facility inside so it has a full gym inside it has a performing arts center it has a beautiful indoor turf field as well as an outdoor turf field um, we have classrooms to accommodate our TKers all the way through our 12th graders um, it has three libraries um, it also includes a um, lecture hall that is a state-of-the-art like state-of-the-art lecture hall that not only is for our scholars but we're looking forward to inviting the community in and family members to participate in um, events um, and it's, it's just a beautiful building. It is very indicative of who we are. Um, it's an excellent facility, and it's a place where scholars can come and achieve excellence, and we're very excited about that. And the outside elevation matches that downtown look of Lincoln with mm -hmm. the red brick and the mm -hmm. columns, and it feels very much Lincoln uh, when you look at the, the city of Lincoln and, and the way the city feels as you come into that downtown. And so it's gonna be a perfect addition to the city uh, and a really great location for educating scholars there in Lincoln as Lincoln grows. Yes, so pivoting back to school <laughs> starting. Um, so even though scholars can't join us, um, we're excited and we invite you to visit our Facebook page. We recently gave a sneak peek video of inside the campus and did sort of a, a virtual tour and we're excited to invite you to look at that and check out the interior of the building, not just the exterior. Um, but we have, um, transitioned and pivoted very quickly in response to the governor's requirement that because we're on the watch list, um, we can't open our doors for scholars on the first day of school. And so we are providing a full distance learning program for our um, scholars. Our teachers have been working for already a week. This is week two. 
They've, so they'll have spent two weeks preparing and ensuring that the curriculum is ready to go for our online learning. And um, we've also offered an option for parents who maybe don't want to come back in the classroom when we're off the watch list and are able to welcome scholars. And so parents could continue with distance learning for the remainder of the year, or they can opt to join us back in the classroom as soon as we get to open our doors. One of the things I love about what our academic, academic team has done is they've created uh, options for families. Mm -hmm. They haven't done a one-size-fits-all where they said, this is what we're going to do and we're going to force this on families. They've said, how can we accommodate the needs of individual families to say, for those that may have a special need at home, uh, maybe they have an at-risk population that they're dealing with, or they have special circumstances, and they don't feel comfortable coming back into the classroom, um, what are we going to do to serve them as well? Um, because the majority of our families did want to come back in classroom, face-to-face -face instruction, five days a week. They wanted a normal program. Right. Um, so while they were building that normal face-to-face -face classroom program, they also accommodated those other families to give them an option as well so that we can continue to serve all of our team. And we did shorten the day slightly to ensure that our teachers have the ability to serve all scholars. But one of the things I'm very proud of that we've done is we've ensured that every scholar is assigned to a specific teacher. At the secondary, they're assigned to specific classes, right? So they have a math teacher and a science teacher and a history teacher. But at the elementary level, they're also assigned to a classroom teacher. Some of those scholars might return to school and be part of the classroom, while others might continue on distance learning. But it was critical for us at John Adams Academy to take our culture and our community and who we are and extend it from our four walls into the home. And as a result, those scholars will feel like they belong. They'll have a community of a classroom. They'll build a relationship with a teacher who is a mentor to those children throughout the school year, whether they're in the seats in the classroom or they're at home. And that was a critical part of our program that we built. And that's one of the reasons why we shortened the day was to allow our teachers then to have the time in the afternoon to build those relationships with the scholars that will continue distance learning past the, um, the time when we can't have scholars on campus. And so um, what are you guys doing to um, meet the tutoring needs of the students um, as they navigate distance learning? That's a great question and I think that's a question that's right at the front of so many parents' mind, especially as parents are wondering, my child hasn't really been in a classroom since March. Where are they at academically and what are their needs? And so we are continuing our full intervention program. We have a teacher who runs an intervention program and balances and manages all the scholars that are in that program. Um, teachers will be holding one-on-one -on -one small groups in the afternoon time. And then our intervention staff and support staff will also be holding intervention groups and one-on-one -on -one groups. Most of them will be online for the time being until we can get our scholars back on campus. But we'll continue to support that program. And then as needs, if needs are deeper or more significant with a scholar, we'll continue with our um, student study team program, with our scholar support team, um, so that they're getting support all along the way. It's a little trickier virtually, but it's something we're committed to doing and having excellence in doing that. Now, the new campus in Lincoln, are you guys at capacity? Um, not or, yet, not yet. yet. So, so we were over at 280 Oak Tree Lane, we were in portables, and so we were limited on size. We, we had uh, only so many we could enroll because we were one class uh, for grade level. But with this new facility, we've gone from having a limit of 250 kids at the old site to we could serve up to 1,600 kids at this new site. And um, so over summer, this is, this is, I'll give you an idea of how interested and how excited families are to join into this program. Uh, we've gone from 250 kids last year um, to now just under 900 kids this year uh, at the new site. And so we still have additional space to go up to 1,600. So uh, we've grown significantly over summer. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well, but the other encouraging and exciting piece of this is uh -huh. not only has our scholar population grow, but our staff has grown. And we are so excited about the scholar, about the staff that we've hired. They can't wait to get in the classroom. They've been um, trained in our classical education model. They've been studying with us and learning and preparing. And so we're excited not only for our scholars, but the additional staff that's going to be serving those scholars. Yeah, and then so the, the wonderful, beautiful building is just one aspect of a program, right? That's sure. the home in which you have for your scholars. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the, the people that make up the program. And uh, Heather does a phenomenal job with her team of, of hiring new teachers and developing them and training them to be able to serve and mentor and inspire these children that come into our school.
And I, I know firsthand because I've seen it in action. <laughs> you know what? So it sounds like um, our audience is having just a little bit of trouble hearing. Okay. So maybe we'll get a little closer to a little, little bit yeah, to the mics. Um, so I feel like this is probably a great time to kind of talk about, um, you know, we've talked about how you guys are navigating our current um, environment um, and how you guys have really stepped up to serve the, the community. Um, but you guys actually have um, another big challenge, right? Yeah. Um, regarding legislation that was kind of haphazardly, if, if I can, uh, you know, put into to action. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. So we just talked about the fact that we've had this planned growth. We've, we've been uh, constructing this beautiful building. We've been planning to welcome scholars. We, we've taken on hundreds and hundreds of, of new scholars at our Lincoln campus. And then um, right as we're getting ready to welcome them, we've already hired staff, we've already ordered furniture, um, we've already gone through this, this building of this program to welcome all these new families. Um, the state of California, in their budget process, um, decided to throw schools for uh, a loop. Yeah. And um, uh, regardless of, of what you think about the state's decision on COVID-19 and sure. their response to it, um, they've essentially shut down the economy in California. And the ripple effect of that is that the state is not taking anywhere near the revenue that they expected to receive in tax, tax revenue and, and other sales revenue and things. And so as a result, they're trying to balance a budget. And one of the easiest ways for them to do that is K-12 education. And so uh, they passed uh, SB 98, which is a, a trailer bill for one of the, the, the budget trailer bills. Uh, and it deals with K-12 education funding. In SB 98, there's a provision that defunds students. Um, what it says is, um, is we're gonna cap all this, the funding for schools at last year's levels. Well, that's great if I'm a school that has not grown enrollment or I've even maybe lost enrollment because I'm gonna get paid the same amount of money that I received the year before. But if I'm a school that's growing and adding new students, then I'm gonna be hurt because those students that are coming, they're not gonna be funded by the state. The state saying we're not going to pay for their education and that is an amazing change to the way funding has always happened in the state of california um, funding has always followed the child right right schools are always paid on a per pupil average daily attendance we're always here this ada or average daily attendance and, and schools are always telling you if your kid's not sick they got to be at school right because that's how they generate revenue mm -hmm. the state has now severed that link between funding following the child and now said we're gonna arbitrarily pay schools based on not how many children they're educating, but on some old stale number from the year prior. Right. So to give you the example, um, with Lincoln, we, we had 242 children enrolled at the time that they were looking at cutting funding. Uh -huh. um, but we've now enrolled close to 900 scholars. They want us to run a program, pay for staff, pay for our facilities costs for this beautiful new building, go through all the costs and expenses of running this program to serve these children on funding that we got last year for 242 children. There's no way that that is possible to do right. without either denying access to children or diluting the program and providing them a program that is not on par with the quality that we expect to give to families or that they expect to receive. Right. So um, if you look at schools, this is not just a charter school issue. Right. This is any child who's going to a public school. Those state dollars will not follow that child to the school of their choice. Um, so if you look around at Western Placer Unified School District, you know they're growing. We're, we're building new villages there that have been approved in the city. And you've got new residences that are coming and families are moving into the community. Those families are not just coming to John M's Academy. They're also coming to Lincoln schools, right. Lincoln public schools. And as they come into these new schools, those students are not going to be funded. You look at uh, the city of Roseville. The city of Roseville is growing, right? Placer County is on the rise. A lot of families are moving here. Every one of those students that are moving to this community that are trying to come to school are not going to be funded by the state. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that the California Constitution provides a direct protection to children for a free and equitable public education. Now, the, the, the federal Constitution doesn't say anything about education. But in California, it's different. California says that every young citizen, every child has the right 
to a free and equitable public education. Well, what SB 98 does is it, is it immediately goes against that constitutional protection. And it says we're gonna violate that constitutional protection and we're gonna sacrifice the education of children because we wanna protect schools and we want to protect somebody other than these children. Right. And, and so when we looked at this question and we looked at this issue, we realized it was widespread. It was not just us. Um, we're, we're looking at projections of about 50,000 children statewide that are being defunded by SB 98. Mm. Um, you look at uh, the fact that it's impacting districts and charter schools, um, homeschool programs, distance learning programs, and we said something's got to be done about this. All right. How often do you sit around the table and you have a conversation about politics, you have a conversation about something, and, and, and somebody says, why doesn't somebody do something? Right. Well, we figured that's got to be us. And so we submitted a, a, a complaint. We, we lodged a lawsuit against the state of California, the governor, and the Department of Education um, to protect the rights of children. Um, to say SB 98 is unconstitutional, uh, it violates the law, it violates uh, the funding equity, and it needs to be overturned. And uh, so joining in that lawsuit are three other schools that have joined with us, as well as a number of students from a variety of schools um, that have joined on as plaintiffs in the lawsuit. And we actually just got word uh, yesterday that uh, it's been assigned to a court. And so we have a hearing coming up on the 17th. And so it's, it's moving and we're trying to get that resolved as quickly as we can. It's also really important, I know I've been going on, but it's really important because the governor and the legislature that gave us this horrible bill right. have said, oh, there's no need for this court case. There's no need for this lawsuit because we're gonna come up with a targeted solution. Even right. though we're the ones that passed it, even though we understood um, that there was an issue before putting it forward, it was still signed, um, trust us, we'll resolve it for you. But they wanna do a targeted fix where they still don't provide funding to each and every child. They're, they're gonna come up with some compromise that says, you know, well, well, we'll fund schools that had planned growth or that had contracts for teachers by a certain date or that had in, kids enrolled by a certain date. Any half measure that they give as a compromise to try to resolve the situation isn't sufficient. And we're gonna pursue this lawsuit all the way through to the end until every child is funded. Because that's really what the heart of this case is. It's standing up for the rights of every individual child to receive the education that they're due. They need to have the right to choose their school and to not have the state say, we're not gonna fund you because you're not going to the school that we think you should be at. And that's as simple as it gets. Absolutely. And you know what, I, I, I just love the tenacity and I love the fact that you guys are going after it. Um, so what does that mean for, for the kiddos that are coming to your school? Because you guys have a quadruple yeah. over the summer and, and school starts in a week. So what are you guys gonna do? We are committed to these families. Yeah. Um, we, we've talked, and, and, and Heather had mentioned, we've hired staff to welcome them. So I think we've hired 31 new teachers across our network and a number of additional support staff to welcome our growth. That's on top of the teaching staff that we had last year. Um, and so teachers and staff had questions of saying, well, what does this mean for us? Sure. If, if these kids are not getting funded, that's a ripple effect. And we said, we're committed to the staff that we've hired. We're committed to these families. We will serve you. We will find a way. Um, whether we have to raise funds, philanthropic interests, um, but that's one of the reasons why we filed this lawsuit, because there is no question that there's a right to these children to get this education, and we're dedicated to them. Now it's time for the state legislature and the governor to be dedicated to these kids as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, you guys know how this show works. Um, we love to open up the discussion yeah. to the audience for questions, comments, um, Mary Lou, how can parents help support the effort? That is a great that question. That is a great question, and we're so appreciative of that question because we are such a part of the community, and so we appreciate and love that you want to be a part of the community that we're building. Um, I'll let Norman give some specific details on how to do that. Yeah, and, and 
anyone in the community can support, whether you have a child at John's Academy or you're at Western Placer Schools or you're somewhere else in the region or you're in Sun City and you don't even have any children in, in public education. This affects everyone. Absolutely. Um, this is a huge, huge issue for the entire community. Um, we actually started a GoFundMe page to help receive um, a revenue so that we don't have to take money from our program that's serving kids in order to fight this litigation or to, to go through um, our efforts to, to supplement their, their program. Um, if you go to johnadamsacademy.org, again, that's johnadamsacademy.org, right on the, the main page there's in the center, it says Fund Every Child. If you click on that Fund Every Child link, it'll take you to a page that will give you information about the lawsuit, uh, what's happening in the media, various uh, articles that have been written on this, and uh, also a link for GoFundMe where you can make a, a donation or a contribution. Um, you can also help by spreading the word. Um, make people aware of what's going on. A lot of people don't realize that this is happening. Um, phone your legislators. You know, call your state assembly member, your state senator, call the governor's office. Um, call the, the chair of the budget committees and the education committees and let them know this is not acceptable. We're not gonna have them balance the budget through defunding children's education. It's not acceptable. Um, the, the more pressure that you put on our, on our elected officials, the more likely they are to resolve this in a fa favorable way. So if they don't, hopefully the courts will make them. But in the meantime, put as much pressure on them as you can to do the right thing. And do you have any idea as far as the timeline uh, for resolution? Um, we have requested uh, an immediate response. Sure. We're, we're filed uh, for a request for an injunction uh -huh. uh, to require that, that if the court rules, then it would put a stay on SB 98 and it would require the state to continue to fund until the, the case can be resolved. Um, and so we're hoping that we can be victorious on that. Um, so we know schools are starting right now. Um, all of our public, the traditional public schools are starting, charter schools are starting. Parents need to have answers and they need to have finality around these things right. uh, in the middle of a pandemic where folks are, are dealing with distance learning and all these other issues the last thing they want to be concerned about is whether or not there's gonna be funding for their child to receive an education that's um, just just not something they should have to deal with no no I completely agree <laughs> definitely just been in the forethought of, of a lot of um, just parents and and the community at large, it's uh, it's a terrible. Problem. And there's there's word from a number of other traditional um, school districts mm -hmm. that are considering filing litigation um, if they wanted to look at um, uh, partnering with us in this lawsuit. You know, if there's anybody out there that is involved in the traditional school system that's negatively impacted by this, um, they can reach out to us at outreach at johnadamsacademy.org and we can get you connected with legal counsel to, to get you supports and information about um, how your district that might be suffering can be assisted as well. That's wonderful. Oh my goodness, I love that. Um, so, do we have any additional questions? Uh, are you still accepting scholars for all grade levels at the Lincoln campus? You want to take that one? Or? So, um, our application window is always open, and you're welcome to visit us again at johnadamsacademy.org. And there's a button right on there that you can click for admissions, and you can apply for your scholar to attend. Um, we still have room at some grade levels, but I think we're getting close to our capacity at our, at our sites. Um, but we welcome you to apply. Um, learn a little bit more about us by visiting the website. Reach out to our admissions team or reach out to um, any of us. My um, email is available on the website. You can always reach out to me, Heather Brown, and I would love to talk with you a little bit more about our programs and help you figure out the application process and get your scholars enrolled. Yep, and uh, you can't get an offer if you don't apply. So go on, apply now, and then we can work everything else out on the back end. <laughs> All right, so this actually <clears throat> excuse me, brings us to our raffle. So you guys know how this works. You're going to share this live video by noon tomorrow. Comment shared in the comments below, and that will enter you into our raffle. And um, so this, uh, for this show, you guys have seen John Adams actually on our show a couple uh, times prior. Um, we actually have a great swag bag basket um, to raffle off, and then we will also be including a $25 gift card to a Lincoln restaurant of your choice. So definitely share this live video. Make sure that you're informing other parents, you know, make sure that uh, people know what's going on 
and uh, you guys can support the cause and then learn more about John Adams Academy. And we will link the, um, the website within the comments as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, so thank much. you. It was such a pleasure to talk to the LinkedIn community and meet with you again, Mitzi. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Any final thoughts? Just that we love your show and thank you for doing this. And you do a great service to the community as well by keeping them informed of everything that's going on in LinkedIn. Oh, thank you. And selfishly, I get to hear everything first. So <laughs> <laughs> that's really why I do it. <laughs> yeah. And we're really excited by this new building and, and being a great community partner in LinkedIn. And right. we, we love LinkedIn. We've been invested in it for some time now. Yeah. And, uh, and we're just really excited to have that grow and become a staple in, in the city. That's great. Well, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, guys. And thank you all so much for watching. And we will see you back soon. Have a good day. Bye.